Brilliant. All right, it's spot on. One minute six. Not there yet, but we'll be there shortly. Uh-huh. Folks, as we, as we start off, uh, I've got three notices for us as we begin. I'll show them to flyers. They're not here yet. They should be here Monday then, so hopefully we'll have them first for Tuesday. First off is seniors' lunch, uh, which is first Wednesday of every month. So Wednesday, 2nd of June is the first one. Everyone over 60 uh, is welcome at that. We'll have lunch, seniors' lunch, uh, a quiz, Bible talk uh, as well. So mark that down in your diary. That sounds good. Great, doesn't it? It sounds class, eh? So come Tuesday, we'll have flyers for you to take away. Why don't you use that as an invitation to perhaps invite uh, family, friends, or neighbours? Other thing is... Uh, oh, good question. I'll get back to you. I should know that. Let's, I'll get back to you. I've probably been spot. I've lost it. Second thing, I know the time for this one. Christianity Explored, 4 o'clock this afternoon. Short course looking at what is Christianity all about? What is, who is Jesus? Why did he come? What is everything about to do with Christianity? If you missed last week's, so that's totally fine. Please do come along this Sunday uh, at four o'clock. No worries. Well, I'll be great, I'll be great to see you there. Got some others coming as well. I'll be class, mate. Absolutely class. It's always a short summary to start anyway. So if you weren't there, follow Tam and Tammy's example. Come along this Sunday. Third thing, got a lovely postcard from Hilary and Ken who are on holiday in uh, Dumfries and Galloway in Ochenlari. It's to Andy and the flock, so I'll take that though, it's a fair game for all of us. I'll leave this uh, on the welcome desk with Owen, so have a read of that as well if you would like to read Hilary's postcard to us. It's lovely, nice of Ken and Hilary to think of that. But as we start, let's pray together. Every week we pray for uh, a country. Uh, it's particularly being persecuted because they're Christians. And this week we are praying for the country of Cambodia. Cambodia, here's some facts about them. They've got, they had a population of 7.5 million when Pol Pot came into power. But four years later, in the late 70s, uh, he'd killed an estimated 2 million people, most notoriously in the killing fields you might have heard of before. Where there was, it's a bit grim, but I think it's helpful to see just how horrible it was. There's so many bodies buried even when there's heavy rain just now, bones and whatnot come up to the surface there. It was awful. Toppling his regime wasn't easy, but as the population has grown, so has the number of Christians as well, which is wonderful. The number of Christians there has jumped from 2,000 to 300,000. Oh, yes, it's great, isn't it? Yep. Percentage-wise, it's not a high percentage at all, but it's wonderful, isn't it? That now in this country, there's 300,000 Christians there. One missionary called J.D. Crowley, he's seen, are you ready for this? Since 1994, since he's been there, he's seen 3,000 people come to Christ. Isn't that, one, isn't that amazing? He has seen 70 churches planted since 1994 as well in that country. And in the last few years, the training at the local Bible school has given pastors from the area, Cambodian people who've been brought up there, born and bred, now Christians and saved, opportunities for them to serve and be trained as ministers. So this morning we want to pray for these thousands of Christians that are now in Cambodia. And we want to be more Christians as well in that country as well. But there's still hundreds of thousands of people there who don't have an opportunity to hear and respond to the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we want to pray for that as well, for even more churches to be planted, more people to be saved in that country, and for more local leaders to be raised up. So we're going to pray for Cambodia. Uh, secondly as well, this last week, um, was the Free Church General Assembly. We're part of a group of churches called the Free Church of Scotland and they had their annual meeting together there. And some really exciting things we want to pray for. We want to pray for plans for church plants up in Wick, up the north of Scotland, Helensborough, towards Glasgow, Winchborough, towards Edinburgh and Gower Shields down in the borders, north, south, east and west. There's a, a number of uh, ministers like myself due to be licensed soon as well and some improvements came through as well to help train potential ministers to go out and help in local churches. So that's for Cambodia, the Free Church General Assembly which happened, and of course our beloved Robertson family who are away on holiday today. Let's pray for them. Let me lead us in prayer. Our great God and Father, we thank you for this opportunity we have to come together to worship you. 
we ask this morning, may you raise our affections to the Lord Jesus Christ. May he be our everything. May we hear your voice, we ask this day. And we come knowing that we don't deserve this. That we are sinful people. We have not loved you with a whole heart, soul, mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbour as ourself. Please forgive us of our sin, we ask. Help us to love Jesus more this morning than to love our sin. Father, we come as well this morning, having had all sorts of weeks last week. May you humble the proud, we ask this morning, by your word. May you raise up the brokenhearted. For a bruised reed you will not break, a smouldering wick you will not snuff out. May you give those of us who are hurting, as many of us, your comfort, your peace, we ask. And we pray for the church in Cambodia. What wonderful news it is in this country to have heard in the last 20 years of 70 churches planted. Thousands upon thousands upon thousands of new believers. But Father, that is, although wonderful and amazing, such a small percentage, may you raise up more workers from Cambodia, save more people, raise them up, train them in these schools to go out and to start more churches, to reach more people with the good news of the gospel. Father, Cambodia is, when people often think of that, it is Paul Potts' regime that immediately comes to mind. How we long for a time when what comes to people's mind isn't that atrocity, but instead a land which loves your word, which loves the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray especially for this missionary J.D. Crowley. We thank you for his labours. May you help him as he continues to serve you through serving your church there. We thank you as well for uh, the group of churches that we're part of as well, the Free Church of Scotland. We thank you for the General Assembly meeting this week and for some of the very encouraging things that came out of that. Discussions to plant uh, 30 churches by 2030. Church plants in the, in the pipeline of approval for the north, the south, the east and the west of this country. And Father, we love the vision that was given there of uh, a gospel church in every community of Scotland. Father, that is a big thing. But you can do great things. And so we ask, may that happen, we ask, not through the free church to build an empire, but we just want gospel churches in each community. May the churches that are currently exist, may you strengthen them, we ask. May you speak to them this morning by your word as you promised to do so. We thank as well for the decisions to help train ministers as well, to help them have... Um, better competency but most importantly to work in their character as well and father we thank you for our own mon our own minister andy we pray for him and for kyrene and uh, finley and lewis and uh, the baby that, that you are knitting together in kyrene's womb bless them we ask this time of rest and thank you for them we love them we miss them but thank you that they are able to to be up north and to have time together as a family uh, being refreshed together May you bring them back, we ask, when their time of holiday is over, having had their strength renewed, their, their zeal for the Lord um, encouraged. Father, we ask this day, may we rejoice more in you, in the goodness of your gospel. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you have your Bible, please do grab it. What page? Oh, chains have broken this. Yeah, one more inch check, Charlie. <laughs> one more inch check. Let me dump this down here. Great, so we are in the book of 1 Thessalonians. Hopefully you've got that open. And we're working through Paul's uh, first letter he wrote to this church in Thessaloniki. And it's a letter we've seen where Paul is in, Paul's encouraging this church, isn't he, to keep going. It's a really, really encouraging letter. And what we saw in chapter one is that, um, well, before that, actually, Paul was so concerned when he left this church. 
He left, there was persecution. He was worried the church was being neglected. And so he sent Timothy. And Timothy came back with news that this church wasn't just doing well. They were incredibly strong. In fact, everywhere that Paul went, they heard news of how well the Thessalonian church was doing. And in chapter 1, we saw what kind of church they were. We saw about their, their authentic gospel conversion that they had. In chapter 2 last week, the, the focus shifted onto the genuine gospel ministry that they received from Paul and his helpers. And Paul was having to defend himself from what others were saying. And he was having to defend himself to defend the gospel because people were slagging him. And Paul reminded them that he came to them as, as a father, a gentle father. He was like a nursing mother towards this church. He says, remember my manner towards you and know that therefore my motives for you are always good. They were always right. And what we see in our passage is that Paul's changing from his past work among the church to his ongoing work amongst them. I mean, that's because this section we're going to look at from verse 13 of chapter 2 sort of mirrors the first section we looked at. I'm a bit of a geek, which perhaps if the glasses don't give that away, you probably know that already. So I've got a table for us because I love a good table, a good graph. And let me just show us some of these similarities uh, we see here. Notice that we've got this idea of thanksgiving. Look at 2.13, it starts. We also thank God continually. We see it start in chapter 1, verse 2 as well. There's this idea of imitation as well. Again, mirroring the first section we saw in chapter 1. And also the, the idea of God's wrath as well we see in verse 16, also mirroring the end of chapter 1. So it's really similar. What's changing is that Paul's going from their initial response to the gospel to their ongoing response and ongoing work in the gospel. So with that in mind, let me read our passage for us and then pray and ask God for help again. So let me read chapter 2 from verse 13. And we also thank God continually, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as a human word, but as it actually is, the word of God, which is indeed at work in you who believe. For you, brothers and sisters, became imitators of God's churches in Judea, which are in Christ Jesus. You suffered from your own people the same things those churches suffered from the Jews, who killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets, and also drove us out. They displease God and are hostile to everyone in the effort to keep us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved. In this way, they always heap up their sins to the limit. The wrath of God has come upon them at last. Let me pray. Let's ask God for his help. Father, we thank you again for your word. May you incline our hearts to your word this morning and not to anything this world has to offer us free us from all distractions we ask open our eyes see wonderful things in your word unite our hearts in reverent fear of you satisfy our hearts in your steadfast love we pray all these things in jesus name and for his glory amen each week at the start, we, we pray for, as we did today, a persecuted country uh, where Christians, brothers and sisters in Christ, are, are getting flack for following Jesus. In the last year, we've heard of Christians who've been beaten, who've lost their jobs, who've been tortured, all because they follow Jesus and because they refuse to worship anyone else. And we don't face things like that, do we? And, and we should thank God for that. But persecution for following Jesus is normal in most of the world. Think back three weeks when we started this letter. Persecution was how this church started. Mobs were after Paul because of his teaching. And he escaped one night and he went down to Berea. And when he was in Berea, the guys up in Thessaloniki found out he was there. And then they came after him again. See, persecution is normal for Christians. One historian even said that the growth of the church in the ages said that the blood of martyrs is the seed of the church. But why is this the case? Why is it that throughout the ages, 
Christians have been persecuted. See, in our passage, we're going to see the main answer to that. In our text, Paul wants to encourage these Christians that they have an authentic faith that endures because God works through his word. And as he does so, he makes them more like him. But as God works through his word, the world works against them because the world hates God. So what I want us to do this morning in light of that is to marvel that we have God's word and also to be prepared for when persecution comes as we become more and more like Jesus. So two points for this morning. You heard God's word, which is now at work within you, and God's word is at work within you, so now the world is at work against you. Let's look at our first point together. Have a look at verse 13. And notice here how Paul starts off. Have a look. He says, and we also thank God. Now, why does he say also? There's a reason before, wasn't there? Chapter 1, verse 2, Paul gives thanks for their genuine conversion. Now he's given thanks that the word they received, they've, they've realised this word is the word of God. Now, we get a lot of folk in here during the church, which is great. And I wonder if you've ever had this conversation with someone, perhaps here, perhaps at home, perhaps with a family member, and you ask them, what would, what would it take for you to believe in Jesus? What would it take for you to believe that Christianity is true? One thing that I've heard quite often is friends saying, oh, if, if I heard God speak to me, like if he literally spoke to me, then I believe in him. I wonder if you've ever had a, conver- uh, a conversation similar to that. Yeah, yeah I've, I've had a few of them, eh? Let's see what Paul says in verse 13. He says, And we also thank God continually, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as a human word, but as it actually is the word of God. So let's just realise what Paul is saying here. Paul is saying that these Christians heard from Paul and Timothy and Silas and they received and accepted this word that they said and they realised this word was actually the word of God. Now, what does that not mean? That doesn't mean that these guys just spoke in Bible verses to them like some sort of riddle. But instead, the message that they shared was the same message of the Bible. Paul is saying, now listen to this, this is life-changing, I think. To listen to the message that these men shared was to listen to God himself speaking. That's Paul's point here. And isn't that incredible? Paul's making the point as well that it was God speaking that opened the hearts of the Thessalonians. It was God's word that did God's work. And what was this message that they shared? Well, Paul in chapter 1 verse 5 calls it our gospel. He calls it the gospel of God in 2.8 and 2.9. He calls it the gospel of Christ in chapter 3 verse 2. Paul saying that the gospel, the gospel Paul, Timothy, Silas all shared was actually God's gospel. And what is that gospel? It's the good news of our risen, ascended Lord Jesus Christ. So to hear this gospel, to hear this good news, to hear this message of the Bible, to get that is to hear God himself speaking to you. Now, isn't that an amazing view of the Bible? Isn't that an amazing view we have as we tell people about Jesus? See, Paul is thankful because as the gospel words took root in chapter 1, verse 2, So now here it is bearing fruit. Now let's be clear about the process of all this. Was there anything special here about Paul, Timothy and Silas? Did these men somehow do something to this message? Give it a bit more more oomph perhaps? Well no, not at all. What made it God's word is simply because it's God's word. If everything was down to these men. If they'd been able to get a crowd together through their 
persuasion, perhaps through their dynamic leadership. When they were forced to leave, there's simply no way this church would have survived. Persecution would have come, this church would have crumbled. But that isn't the case though. This church didn't die. It thrived, didn't it? The gospel seed that had taken root earlier is now bearing fruit in these lives and Paul is thankful for that. And the reason why it's bearing fruit is because it's God's word. Think of it like this perhaps. I was sharing with Tam earlier that last weekend it was our eldest daughter Tabitha's birthday. She was five last week and a few days before her birthday the postman would come They're delivering some, some cards and parcels that people had sent up. I'd be in often when the postman came, I'd put them on the side uh, in, in uh, the kitchen and uh, for Amy to put them wherever she hides presents. I have no idea, but somehow she hides presents somewhere. And when Amy comes back from work, I'd say, oh, have a, you seen what the postman brought? And she would take one look at the handwriting and straight away she'd say, that's not from the postman, that's from so-and-so. Part of me thinks if Amy was in line of duty, she would have solved that crime a lot earlier for any of you line of duty fans out there. You see, Paul and his helpers, they were just like the postman. The gospel message they brought, it, it wasn't theirs, they were just delivering it. But the Thessalonians, like Amy, they knew exactly who it was from. That as they heard the gospel message, it wasn't Paul's message, it was God's message. And here's the thing that we need to realise too as well. That as Andy and I come here each Sunday and teach God's word, the message we bring isn't ours, but God's, insofar as what we say is what this text says. See, through the preaching of the Bible, the voice that we long to hear isn't my dulcet tones, but the voice we long to hear is God's voice speaking to us. Jesus says in John 10 that his sheep know his voice. And when we hear God speaking, it's not like some, some booming voice. And said, think of times perhaps when you've sat here and you thought, is, is Craig, is, is Andy speaking about me here? <laughs> no, we're not. That's God speaking right into your souls. Or think of times when it feels like perhaps, I, I think even in my life, where it feels like the preacher's looking at you the whole time. Trust me, we're not. But then it's times when God is speaking at us and we really feel him speaking into us. See, God's word does God's work. I don't do the work. Andy doesn't do the work. God's word does his work. And the same is true, isn't it? Not just on Sundays when we're together, when we read the Bible perhaps on our own in quiet times or in, or in ladies' Bible studies or, or, or with kids or in one-to-ones, that when we read God's word, God speaks. That means that if we're involved in Bible studies, we want to prepare well. Because we want to share as close as possible what it says in this book. But it also means that if someone who won't believe in Jesus until they hear God's voice says that to you, simply put your sit down and read your Bible out loud to them and they will hear God's word. I mean, I'm banging on about this a lot this morning, that what we have is God's word. I mean, just think of it. He's spoken. We have his words here and he still speaks to us today by the power of his Holy Spirit. I wonder if you've ever grasped that in your hands is the most valuable thing this world has. You thought of that before? God's word is the most valuable thing we have. And when we come and we listen to it and we have it explained to it, to us, God is speaking to us. But what's our job in all of this? Well, I wonder if you noticed what the Thessalonians did. They didn't simply hear it. There's, there's more to listening than hearing. Do you see the three things they did in verse 13? They heard God's word, they received it, and they accepted it. So when we come to God's word, when we're ready to hear him, to come expecting that that will happen, to sit under God's word, accepting God is speaking to me, he has authority here. 
We want to receive it. We want to check that the message that the person is saying to us is what the Bible actually says. And then we want to accept it. To walk in loving obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ. And here's the thing with God's word. It always does something. One way you can look at the Bible is that it's a story of God speaking and things happening. Just think even of Genesis 1, how the universe began. And God said, let there be light. And there was. And God said this and God said that and things happened. Or think even of Jesus in the storm. We'll look at this passage in Christianity Explored later on. He's in the storm, he's on a boat and he just says, quiet, be still. And instantly, storm stops. See, when we hear God's word, he works in our lives and it could be to harden our hearts. But we pray it's to change our hearts. And this usually isn't instant, like, like Jesus calming the storm, but said slowly and often unnoticed until we look back. Think of a time perhaps when you've been to the doctors and you've been put on some new medication and day after day you've been taking this new prescription and it just doesn't feel like anything's happening. Nothing's changed and the temptation's to stop taking that prescription. But then you stop and you look back to how you were two months ago six months ago a year ago and you go wow look how much that has changed me god's word is often similar slowly working away from the inside out like medicine for our souls and as god changes us he changes more and more into his son being like like his son the lord jesus christ and he is the second encouragement paul wants to give his church God's word is at work within you, so now the world is at work against you. Let me read from verses 14 again and see if you can work out why this is so encouraging for them. For you, brothers and sisters, became imitators of God's churches in Judea, which are in Christ Jesus. You suffered from your own people the same things those churches suffered from the Jews, who killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and also drove us out. They displeased God and are hostile to everyone in their effort to keep us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved. In this way, they always keep up their sins to the limit. The wrath of God has come upon them at last. That doesn't sound encouraging at first, does it? it sounds pretty savage what's going on to them. But remember the flow, God's word is working in you. How do we know that? Because the gospel seeds taken root, it's bearing fruit, and you become imitators of the churches in Judea. You are suffering the same things they did. So be encouraged by that. That's what Paul's saying. Paul's encouraging them that their experience is the normal Christian experience when God is at work in you. So in one sense, when that discrimination comes, be encouraged by that. Because that means God's working in you. But why does God's word work in you, in you bring suffering? Well, look at verse 14. They are living for Jesus. They're being imitators. Verse 16, they're wanting people to speak about Jesus. And people hate it because they hate God. And they reject God by rejecting those who, brings, who bring God's word. This is the pattern we see here. This is the pattern we see right throughout the history of the church. When there's opposition to the gospel message, the message of the life, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, this hostility is not at its core against you if you are sharing it, but instead against God himself. It's hostility to God that makes people want to silence God's messengers. That's what's happening at its core. So though we individually might experience flack from people we love because we follow Jesus, although we as a church might experience that together, Ultimately, ultimately, it's aimed at God. I wonder if you remember a while ago, there was news stories of like gagging orders going around in the news when there's stories, but, but the press couldn't, couldn't say who did what and, and what happened. People were silenced from speaking. 
What we see here is that the world is hostile to God. It wants to gag the gospel, it wants to stop that message going out. That's why when we pray for persecuted countries, we don't often pray for the minister because they're the minister, but rather because they're the main gospel messenger in that place. That's why we need to be remembering Andy in our prayers as well. It's easy to say that because he's not here today. We need to be praying for one another as we share the gospel with people we meet. Because the world and the evil spiritual forces at work will try to gag the gospel. And it'll do that by meeting gospel messengers. And they do this because as the gospel goes out, it confronts us, doesn't it? God speaks and he shows us that, that we aren't in charge. It shows us that we're sinners. But we love our sin and we don't want to lose it. I've been doing some, well, I've not, my in-laws have been doing gardening. I'm a parent doing gardening in our house. I watched them do some gardening. That's the most accurate thing, to be honest. But think when you're gardening, think of a stone or a log in, in some soil and you lift it up. And what do the wee beasties do underneath? They want to go hide away back under the darkness, don't they? Because they hate the light and they love the darkness. That's what we're like by, by nature. We hate the light of the gospel. We love the darkness. And people, that's why people are against the gospel, because they don't like it, because it exposes them to what is true. See, we aren't facing the severe persecution that these Christians were. We aren't facing the, the massacre in Cambodia or other countries that we've read about in the last year or so. But for us to follow Jesus, for us to speak to others about Jesus, for us as God's words, makes us more and more like Jesus it might mean that ultimately we lose friends best friends perhaps because they don't like how you're becoming more and more like Jesus as God's words changes you to live differently to want to follow Jesus you might get flack from people and call you all sorts of names because they think that you've lost a plot people might start ignoring you at the school gate because they don't like how you become more and more like Jesus. But remember, this hostility at its heart, although it is incredibly painful at times, and I know some people have lost family because of it, ultimately it is directed at God because you remind them of him. Don't mishear me, this isn't a call to be unpopular, to be rude to people, to look down on them. Instead, this is an encouragement that as God's word changes you and as you live for Jesus and speak for Jesus, that as some people oppose you because of it, be encouraged that God's word is working in your life. The gospel seed you have heard has taken root and now it is bearing fruit. Let's look at the last wee bit here. Have a look from the end of verse 15. Paul says they displease God and are hostile to everyone in their effort to keep us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved. In this way, they always heap up their sins to the limit. The wrath of God has come upon them at last. Last week we saw Paul talking, talking about how he wanted to please God. So he wanted to speak about Jesus. Here we see the opposite. These people opposing speaking about Jesus and so displeasing God. And this is serious stuff. I mean, just picture this scene. Imagine someone is seriously ill, perhaps out on the street down there, being hit by a car or something. They are seriously ill and they are dying. You call 999, you ask for an ambulance, and you, it feels like an eternity waiting for this ambulance to come. But really, it's only been two or three minutes. You hear the sirens getting closer and closer and closer. You see the blue lights flashing brighter and brighter and brighter. But it stops. And some people have parked their cars across the road to stop this ambulance coming on purpose. How would you feel? I'd be raging, wouldn't you? Especially if this was somebody you loved who was dying. This person is in desperate need of this help or they will die. How much more do you think must God be displeased when people are facing eternal judgment and suffering and people are deliberately stopping others from hearing the good news of the gospel? 
See, these Jews described here are deliberately opposing the gospel going out. It's worth noting here, Paul's not anti-Jewish. He was Jewish. He says elsewhere in Romans that he would give up his salvation for them to be saved. But these Jews opposing the gospel, stopping people believing, Paul says they are heaping up their sins to the limit. What does that mean? Well, it means that in their disobedience to God, they couldn't do anything more not to merit God's wrath against them. And that's what it says, doesn't it, at the end? God's wrath is now against them. And for us, I think that's a, a comfort there as well, that if you are under the heat of persecution for following Jesus, that people are trying to stop you from telling others about Jesus, it reminds that God doesn't ignore it, that he sees what's going on, he knows what's going on, and justice will be done. As we come to close, let's, let's tie together everything we've seen in our passage this morning. These Christians in Thessaloniki, when they heard the gospel, they grasped that it was truly the word of God. And as they are hearing God's word, God's word is working in their lives. So every time you come here to listen to God's word, every time you open up your Bible, get ready to meet with God in his word. And as God's word works in your life, he will slowly, slowly, slowly change you to being more like Jesus. Think back for those of you here at our uh, the 20 Schemes Weekender Conference. That's what Andy's talk was on, wasn't it? God changing us to make us more like Jesus. And we see that as the Thessalonians changed, they know God is working in them because the world is working against them. So as you face discouragement, as people oppose you for following Jesus, be encouraged that God's word is changing you because it means that God is at work within you. This is how Paul says, to these Christians you know you have an authentic faith that endures. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for your word that in our hands is the most valuable thing this world can afford. Here are here is the royal law, here are the lively oracles of God. We thank you for this treasure that you have given us. And thank you that you still speak to us today by the Holy Spirit. And Father, may we have, we ask, an authentic faith that endures. May it be evidenced in our lives that as we receive your word, may we grasp and see that it is the word of God. And as that gospel seed takes root in our lives, may it bear fruit, we ask, as we become more like your son, seeking to imitate him and speak for him with the good news of the gospel. But when there's opposition, when the world's at work against us, may we find encouragement in that, may we find strength in that. It means that your word is working in us. Father, help us to love one another well when we are facing situations like that. May we be a support and encouragement to each other. And may you give us boldness, we ask, to share this gospel message. We pray all these things, Lord Jesus, for your glory. Amen. Before we turn to our song this morning, any questions what we looked at at all? What does that part do you? God's work is word is at work within you. I know that, but so now you will is that work again? Yeah, so that's because because God's word is changing us to be more like Jesus. We're facing new Opposition, yeah. The world's like I don't like that. So we're working against so I thought I'd do some fancy word play, but oh, <laughs> Sorry, tell me. No, good, great question. Anyone else? As you mentioned earlier, the two small words, faith and belief, you put them in a pot, blend them, same elements are there. Because when God's in you, I really don't see God. You might not feel God, you might not hear God, but He's in you. Mm. And that faith, the faith and belief tells you that God's inside, God's, God's with you. And uh, mentioned there on about people, the ignorant people, people that are naive, who don't think about God, don't believe in God or Jesus. There's an old cliche that goes, if I see it, I'll believe it. I've always thought about that. 
if you see your friends, my, my family's okay, all my family are religion. Mm. All my family are the believing God in Jesus. That's why I brought them up Catholic. Yeah. But there's a lot of people saying, Say, hey John, do you believe in God or Jesus? Nah, I don't believe in mm. God. If I see something happening, I'll believe in them. But yeah. until I see it, a lot of people are yeah. just saying they're naive. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. As you say, yeah. it's not to so faith and belief in God. Yeah, uh, yeah, I think you're right. There's a really helpful bit at the end of John's Gospel where um, what, what John's doing at the end of the Gospel is showing them, showing them that we ourselves don't need to have seen these miracles because the guys who wrote this have. Mm-hmm. And that we can trust their testimony because they are the eyewitnesses. So our faith is based upon what we know about Jesus from his words. So you're right, that's how we know he's with us because he said so, yeah. because, because of what's... Uh, he said, and and in our afternoons, that's what Christianity sports about. It's come look at Jesus, come what these guys uh, have said about him. I and mean, what we find is that it's almost as if that when you read the Gospels, it's as if Jesus just walks off those pages, and you go, "Wow, this is real." I think mean, when that happens, that's when when we've done what what the Thessalonians have done and gone, "Yeah, this is the Word of God." It starts changing us. Spot on time. It's good. Any questions? Great, let me turn this on. Oh, I better take this off. As usual, we'd love to sing, but we can't. We all have to hum, which is funny, isn't it? Um, let's join and sing together in our hearts anyway. Uh, our song together, yet not I, but through Christ in me. Thank you, Lars.
reads uh, a benediction, which is God's blessing for us. Let me pray. Father, thank you that uh, we have your son. There's nothing greater for heaven to give. What an amazing thing the gospel is, that we can come before you in prayer, that we enter your presence in him, that you are with us by your spirit, and one day, finally, fully, you will make everything sad become untrue. There'll be no more sin, no more opposition to the gospel, but only rejoicing in it. There'll be no more striving against sin within our lives, for you will uh, transform us and make us fully holy like Christ. And we long for that day, we ask. But in the meantime, may we take encouragement when it comes, when we see the gospel seed bearing fruit in our lives, transforming us more like Christ, making us say no to things we used to say yes to. And if opposition comes because we want to live for Jesus, following him and speaking for Jesus with the gospel, may we take encouragement knowing that ultimately there are oppositions against you and that you are working in us by your word. Amen. Amen. Let me read now a blessing, benediction from God's word, which says, Now to him who is able to establish you in accordance with my gospel, says Paul, the message he proclaims about Jesus Christ in keeping with the revelation of the mystery hidden for long ages past, but now revealed and made known through the prophetic writings by the command of the eternal God, so that all the Gentiles might come to the obedience that comes from faith, to the only wise God be glory forever, through Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 As always, want to have a cigarette, obviously go outside. Uh, if you want a cup of tea or anything, sit down, and myself or Rachel will be around giving you one. <laughs>